Well, we're reading the signs, and the signs do look promising. It would certainly appear that the internet gods are with us, and that the stream is streaming, and that somebody's watching, and you can hear my voice, and you can see my address, which means that we must, we've got to be live, and this must be Wednesday, and it's got to be 7 p.m., and I can't be anybody except myself, Malcolm Tent, here for today's episode of Tent Talks Tunes. Waka, waka, waka. Greetings, everybody. <coughs> Excuse me. Hello, Scott LaRock. I see that you are tuned in. And I see some thumbs and... Uh, emojis and things like that, which means that other people are here, even though I can't see your names. That's the wonder of the internet. <coughs> Excuse me again. <clears throat> Just had a nice slug of that delicious extra vitamin and mineral fortified. We got mercury, lead, cadmium. Uh, it's probably some timony and some aluminium, as they say in the UK. This Danbury tap water is heavy, baby, heavy with metals. Thank you to the hatting industry for leaving that behind as your wonderful legacy in Danbury's water table. I don't drink a toast to you. I drink a toast to all of you, my viewers, my friends, my friends. Hey, drink up, everybody. Ah, uh, Scott LaRock. Scott LaRock tells it like it is, baby. Danbury tap. Makes you want to tap out. But it's all we got. It's all we got. Whew, I am moving <clears throat> at about the speed of a Japanese bullet train today. It's been a very hectic, wild, wacky day. Um, on top of that, the pollen is thick out here in the greater Danbury area. Everything is in bloom. And I can feel that pollen coating my eyes <clears throat> and my larynx. So if I sound a little bit <laughs> today, that's what's going on. Um, <clears throat> the upside is that it, it smells beautiful out there. All the flowers are in, are in bloom and it's fragrant. Like just walking down the street, I catch the bouquet of this and the scent of that. There's just like so much popping into life right now. I look out. My window to the left, I see a big wall of greenery. I look out the window to my right, I see trees and leaves. It's very nice here in my humble cabin in the woods in Fairfield County. <clears throat> in fact, I have to drink more of that to get some of this pollen out of my larynx. Woo, doggy. <sighs> On top of that, <clears throat> I have been busy as a double dog learning bass parts. Yes, the Thunder Lumber. I've been uh, having to really woodshed learning some parts to play on the bass guitar. And uh, in fact, I was going to grab a visual to explain to you why I'm so all a Twitter, no pun intended, um, about this bass thing. If you have just one second, I'm going to step behind the curtain. You don't have to pay attention to the man behind the curtain because you won't be able to see him anyway, and he'll be back in front of the camera anyway, but my prop is behind me. So hold on a second. This is the Wonders of Live TV. We're going to stick Harry. There's Harry. Hi, guys. Don't know if you guys will be able to see him while he's sitting on the chair, keeping my seat warm in my absence, but Harry is with us. Everybody knows he's the real star of the show. I'm just the guy who can speak English. I don't know how to speak feline. Harry doesn't speak English, but somehow between the two of us, we have a lovely, wonderful relationship. There he is. There's my guy. The one fanged wonder. The one and a half eared wonderkin. The guy with the blazing yellow eyes. Harry the cat. Who doesn't like Harry? I can't even imagine somebody who doesn't like Harry. Harry's my boy. So we'll see how long Harry stays on camera. How about not at all? So anyway, everybody say hello and now goodbye to Harry. <clears throat> Woo! <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, moving the, uh, at a rapid pace because I picked up a very good gig and I, I am allowed to announce it. I will be playing bass guitar 
for Pro Fanatica. Yes, Pro Fanatica. American black metal pioneers. There's some debate as to whether or not they were the very first black metal band in the U.S. I'm going to go ahead and say that they are, because I haven't been able to find any sort of concrete evidence disclaiming that fact. So Profanatica, from of all places, Brewster, New York, they will be on tour in July and August all around the U.S. of A., and I will be playing the bass guitar. We're going to start in Cleveland on July, I think, 14th. Go out to Portland and then down the California coast and then through the desert and back east and then going to hang a left at uh, Atlanta and end up in Chapel Hill. So it's going to be three solid weeks of black metal chaos. And um, the reason why I'm so completely wound up right now is I got the first nine songs of the set to learn. And let me tell you people right now, this stuff is not easy. This stuff is quite difficult to learn. Multiple time signatures, multiple parts and movements to every song. Um, there are more notes in your average Profanatica song than there are on your average Ramones album. And that's just for one song. So I have been just hammering it out, <clears throat> and I was doing that right up until just about airtime. So... By the time Profanotic actually hits the road, I should have this stuff down, but it's taken a lot of work. That's what I got to do to not be a jake when I hit the stage. I take this music very seriously, along with all the music I do. So now you know Profanotica, and if you want to check out some Profanotica, there's Profanotica all over the place. If you want to purchase this LP, which is now available on my label, TPOS, you can get it recorded live in 1991. I was the guy pushing the buttons on the cassette recorder long before I had joined the band or had anything to do with the band. Get it for me now, either direct or on my Discogs store. I haven't put it on the eBay store yet, but it will be there soon. Profanatica, baby. You heard it here first. And so that's why I'm busy and why I'm basically winging it today. Oh, Lord have mercy. Scott LaRock asks, is it good to be home? Yes, it's good to be home. It's always good to go out and hit the road and be a rock a roller and uh, tour and all that, but it's always good to come home as well. It's kind of like an ideal situation. I like leaving and I like coming back. So yes, mazel tov for that. So why don't we uh, do a quick check of what's going on here. Let's check the bulletin board and check the mail, and then we can talk tunes. First thing, first item on the bulletin board is um, actually I'm wearing it. You can see this is a Devo T-shirt for the devotional. It's a uh, what shirt is this? God, the 2009 devotional. We've been doing the devotional now for over 20 years, and the next devotional Devo fan gathering is the weekend of September 23rd at the Beachland Ballroom in Cleveland, Ohio. It's going to be a, a grandiose, grandiloquent, positively just grand period gathering of Devo fans. <clears throat> Happens Friday and Saturday. There's going to be tons of bands playing, guest speakers, um, all kinds of audiovisual stimulation, and a great big ballroom just full of freaks and geeks who love Devo and 1980s music and new wave culture in general. Awful lot of fun. Uh, doesn't look like I'm going to be playing at Devotional this year, but I will be there. Um, I have a special recorded project that I intend to debut at Devotional. And if it gets the reaction that my last recorded project does, it's going to be hell breaking loose when people hear it. It's going to be a polarizing event. Some are going to love it, some are going to hate it. But it's all Devo, so it's okay. So yes, yeah, September 23rd, devotional. Let's see that my pal V. Lichter is tuned in. She'll be there. I cannot imagine V. Lichter missing a devotional. So there you go. Hey, Lee, how you doing? Um, let's see, what else is happening on the bulletin board? Well, devotional, yes, the week after that, 
September 30th at the Ground Zero in Spartanburg is indeed Anti-Scene's 40th anniversary concert. Yes, indeed he do. We got all kinds of stuff cooked up for this one. I'm not going to reveal any surprises, but I can pretty much guarantee special guests, many members from past lineups, songs that have been rarely, if ever, performed live on stage, along with, of course, all the great anti-scene hits. So, September 30th, anti-scene, ground zero, Spartanburg. Get your earplugs in now. Prepare yourself. Um, looking a little bit more re to the more near future, the not so distant future. June 22nd at the Masquerade in Atlanta. Yes, anti scene opening up for Fear. Fear's only headlining East Coast date. I'm pretty sure it's the only one. I'm, uh, if I recall correctly, they're being flown in for this one. They're going to play and then they're going to fly back out. And we are opening. So that's going to be red hot. Lots of Pistol packing mamas and papas at that show. It's going to be a real rock and roll shootout. June 22nd at the Masquerade in Atlanta. Combined 86 years of punk rock experience on one stage at one gig. Woo, doggy. Alan Versapellis is tuned in. He says, two of the best bands ever. Alan, you're right. You are totally right. Toby Plumenbaum. Toby Plumenbaum wants to know, is this live? No, Toby, it's Memorex. What else is happening? Well, coming up this weekend in Maplewood, New Jersey. You know, it's not enough. It's not enough for me just to go out to these wonderful far-flung foreign places and rock out. I like to go to far-flung foreign places and sell records. So I'm going to be at the Maplewood, New Jersey Record Fair this Sunday, this coming Sunday. I'm going to have a great big table full of high quality used and new vinyl. That's records to you people who are of a certain uh, demographic, a certain age group. Records, vinyl, platters, whatever you want to call them. I'm going to have tons of them. And uh, yeah, Maplewood, New Jersey, this Sunday, the 21st. I think it's going to be an awful lot of fun. So come on down for that. And I think that's everything going on the bulletin board, of course. I mentioned my Discogs, my eBay, my Bandcamp, my YouTube channel. <sighs> what else can I tell you? I'll tell you what happened when I opened up my mailbox. Toby Bloom, Toby Plumenbaum. I'm sorry I can't get your name right, dude. I'm, I'm American. I'm an ugly American. Toby Plumenbaum says that that will be the greatest show that Fear ever played. Who am I to argue? You think I'm going to say no? It's like when we have when we have bands opening for us, you know, whether it's Anti Scene or Profanatica. Anti Scene's official position is that we want the best bands possible to open up for us. We want bands who are going to go on stage and make us work extra hard. And I, I have the same attitude when I play my solo acoustic shows. I, I want to be put to the test. I want to have to rise to the occasion. I like having to really, really knuckle down and deliver the best show possible. And having somebody on the bill who kicks ass is the best way to do it. So I'm all about that. So yeah, we have one item in the mailbox. You can see here's my address. P.O. Box 3626, Newtown, Connecticut, 06470 in USA with the postscript do not bend this is from uh, my main man Callie Hellstrom out there in California pretty sure I'm pretty sure I know what this what I'm pretty sure I know what this is <coughs> I think my brain's getting all clogged up with pollen today good lord mm, 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 mm. Ooh, that pollen's making a nice Paste with all that Danbury heavy metal tap in my esophagus. Sludgy. Real sludgy. So yes, Callie, we're going to bust out a million mile scissors. I think we're up to a million and one now. As my pal Mike Lesser out there in Vancouver pointed out, we've broken the million mile mark by now. Murray Gellman in Tucson, you know what I'm talking about. We're going to bust out the million mile plus one scissors and start cutting. This is a cold unveiling of a package. Even though I think I know what's in it, it's 
got an interesting shape and size to it, which is not indicative of anything I'm expecting. So let's see here. This is uh, a mutual thrill of discovery we got going on here. We're slicing and dicing. We're ripping and tipping. And now we reach our hand into the envelope to pull the contents out slowly but surely. By the way, I'm just gonna I'm gonna tell all you people right now. I've had this idea forever for a musical side project under the name of Slowly and But Surely. Pretty good, huh? Slowly and But Surely. I'm gonna laugh a minute. So if anybody out there comes out with a project under that name, I want points. I want points on all sales. All right. All right, see, Callie himself is tuned in here. So this is it. I'm opening the package you sent me, dude. And what do we have here? Well, we've got a very exciting piece of cardboard. People don't know it, but I take a lot of joy in packing materials. I really do. One, two pieces of cardboard. This is very exciting. Ah, okay, now I see the object that made the strange shape and the... Uh, the weight that I was not expecting. This is, and Callie knows me very well, a reel of tape. Look at that. A wonderful, generic 1970s reel of tape. This is a label I've never heard of. Sound Center. I don't know this. Ah. just ma Okay, manufactured by Ampex. And apparently, you can only get it at Pay and Save which must be a supermarket, pay and save. Hmm, I like that. I love these regional sorts of things. And what's on it? Wow, somebody recorded Car Wash, the great Rose Royce song working at the car wash. These eyes, these eyes can't help but crying. And the rubber band, rubber band man. Three awesome songs on a reel of tape. Tally, thank you very much. Most likely I'm going to... Uh, take the big old degausser to this thing and make it a blank tape and start recording stuff on it because that's what I do, boo. So that's cool. That's the opening act. And then we have the main event. Yes, I, this is my first time seeing this. I helped to get this thing manufactured. I helped to broker the deal. But here it is officially in hand. Callie Hellstrom, The Wolf Within. This is a brand new release on the long-haired weirdo label. That is a label run by Jeff Clayton, the big boss at Anti-Scene. And he has gone ahead and done it. Look at that. My copy is signed and numbered. I love stuff like this. Yeah, it's pretty good, man. The only time I ever saw this was on a computer screen. Now I'm actually holding physical media. And I got to listen to this before... Uh, the CDs were made. This is like really cool, dark, ambient, spooky, spoken word stuff with real sort of, dare I say, hellish landscapes going on sonically. And if that's your kind of thing, I think that the Callie Hellstrom Wolf Within CD is going to be your kind of thing. See, it, it attracts black cats. Just by waving the Callie Hellstrom CD around, I had a black cat come to me. Now, some people might think that a black cat is an omen of mad luck. I think a black cat is a darn good thing. So check it out. It has just been shown on the internet live that the Callie Hellstrom CD attracted at least one black cat to come and sit on my shoulder. I think that's pretty cool. So Callie, thank you very much. If you would like to post a link to where people can get this thing, then please do. Please do. The people need what you got. You got to tell them where it is and how to get it. And as you can see, Harry is reacting very favorable to it. This is kind of uh, unheard of. Harry making two appearances on one episode of Tent Talks Tunes. It's never happened. Never happened. Look at this guy. Yeah, I got a cat in my ear. Aww. So yes, thank you. Really appreciate it. Totally appreciate the blank tape as well. And I got one more thing. This, um, I was thinking about saving this for last, but um, I will save this for last because I did tease it 
and it's the kind of thing that's never been seen before on Tent Talks tunes, so I'm going to save it for last. What do you think about that? What do you think about it, son? Save it for last? I think he means, yes, save it for last. So what do you say, gang? Let's talk tunes. Let's get some water going here. I've learned to live my entire life with just one hand. <clears throat> one hand for the cat, one hand for everything else. So, yeah, um, as mentioned before, I've been the, a busy bee and um, woke up this morning and didn't really have any ideas whatsoever about what to talk about when I realized that all I had to do was look over to my left and there's a great big pile of records sitting there. And the pile of records is sitting there because... As you probably know, I did radio on WNHU in West Haven for many, many years, from uh, 2005 until 2020. Good 15-year run doing uh, radio. And um, because of changes in policy at the station that uh, I completely, utterly disagree with, I'm not doing radio anymore. Because of those policy changes, I could not do what I consider to be good radio anymore. So I said, screw it. I ain't going to do it. Um, and so because of that, I started calling out a lot of records from the personal collection. You know, when you've, when you're doing a radio show and you've got two hours of time to fill every single week, you really, really, really have to put a lot of effort into finding new stuff to play. And I never really thought about that until I started doing it. Two hours a week is a lot of time to fill. Luckily, I'm a, a, a music maniac, and I love getting new records and tapes and CDs, so it was never too much of a struggle. But boy, howdy, this stuff piles up after a while. You end up with a lot of dang records and tapes and CDs. And I, I came to realize that now that, I'm, now that I'm not doing radio anymore, a lot of these are things I'm just never really ever going to listen to on my own. You know, they were a lot of fun for putting sets together and stuff that would sound great on the radio, but nothing that I'm going to sit around and play just for enjoyment at home. And also lots and lots and lots of records, uh, albums in particular, that only have like maybe one really good song on them. So it just doesn't make any sense to keep all these records when they only have one killer song on them, or they contain music that I would love to play on my radio show, but I'm not going to listen to at home. So I've started culling stuff, and uh, just looking at the stuff I culled, I've got a pretty interesting little stack of uh, tunes to talk about here on Tent Talks Tunes. The irony being, and you know, we all know that life is full of irony, all the records I'm going to talk about are the ones that I'm keeping. Because what fun is it talking about the records you're going to get rid of? These are all the ones I'm keeping. As far as the ones I'm getting rid of, Keep your eye on my Discogs store because the vast majority of them will be going for sale on my Discogs page. Uh, a pretty fair chunk of them will be sold in person at various events like the Maplewood Record Show in New Jersey and wherever else I'm going to be. But it's going to be a lot of stuff up for grabs and a lot of it is really bizarre and eccentric and left field. So if you like that, keep an eye open. So the first pile, first record on the pile that was sitting there is probably the most bizarre record in the entire stack. So why not begin with the genuine, honest-to-gosh, real, weird stuff? Now, as with almost everything in life, there's a backstory as to how I discovered this particular artiste, and um, it's quite a story. <clears throat> okay. We have to go back to, as is so often the case, my label, TPOS. I've been releasing stuff on record, tape, CD, and as you just heard, reel to reel for uh, coming up on just about 40 years now. God, it's actually been over 40 years. Gee whiz. No, sorry, 39. Next year is going to be the 40th official anniversary of TPOS as a label. So for 39 years, I've been releasing records and tapes and CDs reel to reels, eight tracks. Ah, eight tracks. There's the magic term right there, eight tracks. 
Now you people know how much I love 8-tracks. You will see plenty of them listed on my Discog store. All stuff. Well, for example, my fabulous band Ultra Bunny. This is a title by Ultra Bunny that is available only on 8-track and reel to reel. I think it looks pretty darn good. Here's another one uh, for all you real fans of the macabre. Uh, Reverend Jim Jones and the People's Temple Choir on 8-track. Why did I make this? Because I had to. I had no choice in the matter. I had to do it. These things come out really good. I love the way they look. I like the way they sound. 8-track is just a great, wonderful format. So, the catch is that making 8-tracks is a bit of a pain. If you look on my YouTube channel and go backwards, I did an entire episode of Tent Talks Tunes on what it, what I do in order to run my label on a day-to-day -day basis. And that includes a, uh, a brief run-through of how I process the 8-tracks to get them ready for manufacturing. It's a really long, involved process. A another part of the process is actually acquiring the 8-tracks to record over. Because you've got to remember, 8-tracks haven't been manufactured in any large quantity in, to use the same number, almost 40 years. I mean, 8-tracks were uh, pretty much off the shelves in regular retail stores by 1983-ish. And they, kind of, they lingered on for a few years after that in places like the RCA Music Club and Columbia House. You can get them by mail order. But as far as them being an item that you could walk into a store and just buy brand new off the shelf, they'd kind of ceased to exist by the early to mid 80s. So these things haven't been manufactured in any kind of great quantity in about 40 years. So the only way I can really find eight tracks that I can repurpose is to, well, you know, scour the thrift shops and scour the flea markets and the, the estate sales and all that. You can find them out there if you look hard enough. But the problem is, for my purposes, they have to be sealed. They have to be sealed, brand new 8-tracks. Because, I'm, you know, I'm selling these as new products. They can't, they got to be perfect. They can't be scratched or scuffed up or moldy or water damaged. They've got to look perfect. They've got to be shiny and new they got to have that good sheen on them. And the only way to do that is to get factory-sealed old stock. And that stuff is a little more catch-as-catch-can. But because of the wonders of eBay, through due diligence, one can a lot of times find job lots of old sealed 8-tracks, like new old stock. I mean... When 8-tracks stopped being a thing, there ended up being warehouses full of them that were never sold. And a lot of them were cut out and deleted, and they just sat in storage for decades. And uh, every now and again, you know, somebody will unleash a supply of them, either from a like an estate sale or a liquidation sale or a, a warehouse goes out of business. You know, they, they turn up. So I look for these job lots of sealed 8-track tapes. And the ones that I want, I don't want anything that's good. I don't want any name brands. I want uh, ones like this. <clears throat> Georgie Fame. You know, the record that nobody bought. Georgie Fame on 8-track. See, sealed, original on Island. What other kind of junk do we have here? Um, the Natural Sound. Yes, The Natural Sounds. This is a compilation of... Uh, Easy listening stuff, I guess. Hmm, they got some Bob Dylan tracks on here. Blown in the Wind, Joan Baez, Jose Feliciano, Linda Ronstadt, whatever. It's an adult contemporary 8-track. Sealed. Uh, let's see, here's one. Oh, I already, I already busted this one open. Happy Birthday USA. You had tons of these things around the Bicentennial. Um... What's this? Who is this guy? Danny O'Keefe. Danny O'Keefe. Yes, Danny O'Keefe. You don't. You wouldn't even imagine how many Danny O'Keefe eight tracks there are out there, sealed, and um, just ready to be repurposed. So that's what I do. I buy these giant job lots of old sealed eight tracks, and to repurpose them. 
And the, the vast majority of it, as I just pointed out, is stuff that no one's ever going to buy. I mean, even on vinyl. Are you gonna, is anybody going to pay more than a buck for a Danny O'Keefe album? I doubt it. On 8-track, I know it ain't happening. So I repurposed them. And that's what the overwhelming majority of these things are. But, but, and there's always a but. <clears throat> Every once in a while, in these giant mountains of mediocre, unsold, um, Love Unlimited Orchestra 8-tracks, something weird will pop up. And in one case, I found this, and I've talked about this one before, but I, I just love the story behind this because it's so damn bizarre. I saw this one in a box, and it had already it had been through the ringer, as you can see by looking at it. It was uh, at some point it got flooded out, and the the slip case is all wrinkly from water damage, the spine of it started to peel a little bit, but it was something like I had never seen before. It definitely was not a major label release. It was some kind of weird independent thing. Grant Allen. Okay, if you can read that. Grant Allen, two seconds after death and beyond. Recorded live. Not only that, it's volume two. Okay, right away, this is not your average truck stop fodder. Grant Allen, Volume 2, Two Seconds After Death and Beyond, recorded live. Now, the graphics are pure truck stop. That's like the, the absolute generic type of truck stop bargain bin graphics you see in a completely generic slipcase. But the song titles, Frozen Dead Awakens... Beyond Infinity, Blood Mojo, Space Holocaust, Nuemo Requiem, Odyssey Libido, Dante's Orient, and The End of the End. My friends, this has nothing to do with Fleetwood Mac at all. And the, uh, there were actually two of these in this stash of just totally generic old dead stock. So obviously I had to put this one aside and I played it. And it ended up being some of the most wild analog synthesizer freak out music I've ever heard in my life. Totally lo-fi, genuinely bizarre. And believe me, I know my bizarre music. Whatever this Grant Allen thing is, it was downright, for real, weird. And I fell in love with it immediately. And um, <clears throat> total mystery. Like, I, you know, it was not listed anywhere. You know, I did all my, my research on the internet and discogs and all that. No mention of this guy Grant Allen anywhere. Or of the album title. It's not on a label. It's completely generic total mystery as to what this weird ass electronic album was that only appeared on 8-track. And um, so that just made the mystery even deeper and that much more fascinating. It's like, okay, now we've got this really bizarre music that I found stuck in a great big box of um, unsold Guess Who 8-tracks with no pedigree, no history, nothing. Very unusual. So, I dubbed it onto uh, cassette and CD just so I'd be able to play it without risking any damage to the cartridge. Excuse me, folks. Gotta loosen that pollen up somewhat. <clears throat> and played it, I played it a lot because it's just so bizarre. And um, I just started paying attention to different conversations and posts by, by friends of mine who are into that kind of thing. And I saw some stuff from my pal Aaron Dillaway of Hanson Records out in Ohio. Now, Aaron is a big fan of this kind of stuff. So I figured if anybody would know what this Grant Allen is, he would know. So I wrote to him. We corresponded back and forth. I sent him some MP3s. 
And he said, I can't say for sure, but I'll bet you anything that it's by this guy. And I don't remember his name. That's why I've got this visual here. What is his name? You think you would think that I would have this guy's name memorized by now? Nick Rachevik. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Nick Rachevik. Aaron said that this thing has all the hallmarks of a Nick Rachevik product. So I looked up Nick Rachevik, and sure enough, the guy had a ton of stuff out. Um, all independently released except for one, and all of it with song titles like the ones on the 8-track. And lo and behold, one day I was browsing through a record store in New Haven, and I saw this album cover. Now, right off the bat, you can tell there's something weird going on here. I don't know what this is. I still don't know what this is or what it's supposed to represent. That's the front. There's the back. That must be old Nick Rachevik himself. Wonderful portrait. And then I saw some of the titles. Beyond the End, Eternity, Life's Timelessness. Uh, Beyond the End. Uh, did that sound familiar? Um, to Go, To Do is To Be, Deathless. Definitely some thematic constants between this and this. And upon playing it, sure enough, it's a lot of really weirdo analog synthesizer. Uh, a lot of it sounds like it's freeform or improvised, but it's got this really dark undercurrent too, and it doesn't sound like anything that anybody was making in the early 70s, which is probably when this came out. So it's because of my eternal quest for cheap 8-track job lots that this one just completely randomly popped up in the middle of one of these nameless faces wads of 8-tracks, which led to my happy discovery of this guy Nick Rachevik. And what is probably going to lead to an actual release of this on vinyl as a co-production of TPOS and Hanson Records out there in Ohio. And Aaron and I were talking about this uh, a few years back around uh, early 2020. And as we know, everything got really weird in 2020 and a lot of stuff got knocked off the rails. So this project got put on the back, 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 back burner. But this is my reminder to myself to contact Aaron and see if he still wants to do a vinyl issue of this extremely odd and unusual 8-track by Grant Allen, who is most likely Nick Rachevik. Bizarre. And I love it. Love it. As Alice Cooper Group, the group, would say, love it to death. You know something else I like? I like English eccentrics. I'm a big fan of whimsical, eccentric English poets slash musicians. Probably the most obvious example I could think of would be the Bonzo Dog Band. They're like the, the closest group like that that's got any sort of name recognition. Individuals like John Cooper Clark, Ivor Cutler, uh, Max Wall... John Doey. There's something about these dudes. It's uniquely English and very off kilter. Very smart. All of these guys. Very smart. Very intelligent. And almost always really good musicians. And I remember back in the early to mid 80s, there was a brief bubble of interest in this group called the Jazz Butcher. <coughs> Excuse me. Didn't know much about them. I knew that when I worked at Open Books and Records in North Miami Beach, Florida in uh, 1985 going to 1986, we did some traffic in Jazz Butcher Records. And then when I moved up to Florida in 1986, there was still some interest in the Jazz Butcher. They got some college radio play and, you know, there's just a slight buzz of interest about them. I didn't really think too much about it because it seemed like they were just one of a million import bands that had just a, a little bump of uh, airplay and people interested in them. So I never, I just never really thought about it um, until I found one of their records, 
while cruising for stuff to play on the radio in a dollar bin. And I said, you know, for a dollar, I'll take a chance of just about anything. And look, looks kind of interesting. You know, it's not like your average major label product. It's not major at all. It's on an independent label, Glass Records. And, uh, you know, UK, 1986, I believe. Interesting titles, uh, just like Betty Page, Caroline Wheeler's Birthday Present, um, I Need Meat. I'm intrigued. Southern Mark Smith. Hmm, these guys know what they're talking about, obviously. And, um, uh, Guess what? It's a really good record. It's based around, um, as my main man, James Pogo. I knew James Pogo would know about this one. Basically, one dude, Pat Fish, with a revolving cast of supporting characters. And it's great. It's got that whimsical, eccentric English sense of humor with some really good musicians, including David J. and Kevin Haskins of Bauhaus on it. Who says you gotta be, uh, who says you can't have a sense of humor if you're in Bauhaus? Pretty wacky stuff. And I got a real liking for this. I was just playing it this morning. It's like, God damn, this guy's cut from the same cloth as all those dudes I love. The Max Walls and the John Cooper Clarks and the Ivor Cutlers. You could even say Mark E. Smith really probably fits into that, that mold. So as of today, I'm a big Jazz Butcher fan. And I've decided to track down as much of their stuff as I can. And I promise you, if I find anything by the Jazz Butcher in a $1 bin, I will buy it. So yes, whimsical, eccentric English people. I don't know if that's an actual genre, but I think it should be. I think it deserves to be. If you guys want a treat, if you like that kind of stuff, look up a song called Dream Tobacco by Max Wall. Perfect example of the kind of thing I'm talking about. And James Pogo, do you know Max Wall? Does anybody out there know Max Wall? Does anybody out there know Ivor Cutler? Can I see some raised hands or a uh, any kind of reaction from anybody who knows who Ivor Cutler is or and or Max Wall? I'm a big aficionado of, of Ivor Cutler, man. I love Ivor Cutler. If I get it together enough, <clears throat> and I'm not too uh, frazzled later, I'll I'll try to post a link to Dream Tobacco by Max Wall and or just about anything by Ivor Cutler. <laughs> I love Ivor Cutler so much, man. So, so good and so, so funny. Um, yes, as James Pogo pointed out, the Max Wall 45 was on stiff. It was a stiff release and I've got probably six or seven copies of that single in my inventory. So if you want to come down to Maplewood, New Jersey, and buy one, please do. If you like that eccentric, that eccentric whimsy, you're going to love it. If you want to get one by mail order, talk to me. I'll hook you up. It's another one of those records I found in a total random job lot of basic junk records. And that was a good day when I came across that one. You know what else is cool? This right here. Now, you really can't tell what's going on with it because of the, the way it's packaged. It just, you know, basically all you see is India and a big elephant and the fact that it's on Capitol Records. So you kind of figure, all right, well, it's Indian music. You know, great, Indian music, wonderful. But if you read the fine print, put on your peepers, you will see that the full title is Modern Motion Picture Music of India. Ah, Modern Motion Picture Music. That's a good sign. And boy, am I going to mangle these names. I am totally going to mutilate these names. Lata Mangeshkar, Lata Mangeshkar, and Hemant Kumar, with chorus and orchestra recorded in Calcutta. Okay, guys, in short, it's Bollywood, and it's an early Bollywood record. And uh, sure enough, you look on the back, there's a little, you know, good liner notes. Modern music, modern motion picture music of India. There are the two stars. And um, I don't know what the year. It looks like early 60s, probably early. Actually, I'll take that back. The liner notes say music from two of India's most successful motion pictures of late 1956. Mid 50s, kids. This might, I'm going to go out on a limb and say this because I've never seen any other example of this on vinyl in the States. This might be 
the first Bollywood soundtrack record and maybe the only one ever released in the States during this time period and probably the only one released at all unless it was on, you know, some specialty label that caters to the Indian population of this country. I wonder. I'm going to go ahead and say it right now. I'll bet you this is the only major label Bollywood soundtrack, let alone one from 1956. If anybody has got information to the contrary, please post it, because I want to know. This is a great record. I love this. I mean, it's got... All of the best elements of Bollywood, which is traditional Indian music, heavily laced with Western influences. And, you know, a lot of the later Bollywood stuff is popular and famous because there's a lot of disco, a lot of heavy metal, a lot of rock and roll. And you get this amazing cultural mishmash in these soundtracks. This predates all of that. So it's basically Indian classical music mixed with Western orchestral music. And it's great. It's very sublime. You know, there's some really wonderful drone music in here. And um, Hemant Kumar, she's the woman. She's got this, you know, beautiful, high-pitched Indian singing voice that just kind of floats all over the whole thing. This is a great album. Another one that I found for a buck somewhere. Well worth the dollar. And let's hear it for Bollywood. I have quite a few Bollywood albums in the personal collection, including one, the soundtrack to a movie called Disco Dancer, which uh, my boys D-E-V-O from O-H-I-O uh, culturally appropriated for their own song called Disco Dancer. And uh, the Devo song and the Devo video are certainly very nice, but I guarantee you, you've seen nothing in your life until you've seen the original Bollywood video for the movie Disco Dancer. And uh, same deal, if I got the presence of mind, unless somebody out there beats me to it, I will attempt to post a link to that clip, because you got to see it to believe it, and after seeing it, you probably still won't believe it. Man, that's good stuff. Here's another random record that I was going to purge, but decided to keep. George Avak. Blues Country Style. And you can see on the back, it's George Avak in the Avak style. I've got to admit, guys, I've been uh, kind of a late comer to country music. <clears throat> I am uh, not ashamed to admit that in my earlier formative years, I was a bit of a rockist. I suffered from rockism. I mean, I've always... I've never, like, totally shut my mind... To other forms of music, but I was always just so busy rocking and rolling that I never really had time for any other form of music, no matter what it was. And of course, there are certain types of music that I just plain don't like. And, you know, just uh, for a very long time, I paid no attention whatsoever to country music, mainly because what I've been exposed to by and large was crappy, commercial, modern-day Nashville radio-friendly pop country music. And I know that that type of music's got defenders out there. And I've even heard, in the last year or two, I've heard some pretty good music from those types of bands and that genre. I'm never too old to have my eyes opened up a little bit. But uh, by and large, my favorite type of country music is more traditional, more gut bucket, more raw, more weird and unusual. And this guy, George Avak caught my attention because, first of all, his name is George Avak. I'm going to guess he's probably Eastern European, and I'll bet you money his real name is Avakian. How much you want to bet? Badly anglicized to Avak. The thing that caught my interest about this one was the fact that, um, you can see there, it's on the K-Arc record label. And the only other release I'd ever seen on the K-Arc label was one of my favorite songs of all time, one of the greatest country songs of all time. I'm talking about Psycho by Eddie Nowak. And that's another one of those songs. You gotta hear it. And even after hearing it, you still probably won't believe that such a record ever could have been pressed on the vinyl, especially in the late 1960s. 
I do a version of that song in my solo acoustic set. Uh, Elvis Costello did a version of it, but I'm not even going to try to think that I can cut the original. But anyway, Psycho by Eddie Nowak was on the K-Arc label. So here's the second ever K-Arc record I've ever seen, and I figure if this label put out Eddie Nowak, that old George Avak must be worth a listen. And sure enough, it's pretty good. It's not like, uh, it's not 10 up, 10 down, all killer, no filler, but it's definitely got some good songs on it, and he's definitely got a style all of his own. So as part of my ever burgeoning and ever growing knowledge and appreciation for country music, old George Avak became a blip on my radar. And, um, you know, next time I see if he's got anything else, I don't know. I'll certainly be inclined to pick it up. And the same thing with anything on the k Ark record label, because Eddie Nowak and George Avak, they're batting a thousand so far, kids. Country music. I'm drinking to it. <clears throat> By the way, this is um, another unprecedented occasion. Not only has Harry made two on-camera appearances in this week's episode of Tent Talks Tunes, but Harry has been sound asleep on my lap this entire episode. And he hasn't been snoring. He's been very quiet. But Harry is very peacefully curled up on my lap as I'm talking about guys like George Avak and Eddie Nowak and Bollywood and great stuff like that. I had a couple of other things I was going to talk about, but I'm sort of running out of time, so I'm just going to... Um, I'm going to do a quick mention of one record. Oh, see? Speak of the devil, he shall wake up. There he is again. Hello. No longer a sleeping beauty. Now a wide awake beauty. Harry, my boy, I'm going to evict you because my leg was falling asleep. There you go. See you later, dude. My pal Adam Zisser from uh, Atlanta, Georgia sent me a yard sale in a box a few weeks ago, and I did a live unveiling of it here on Tent Talks Tunes. It is, of course, archived on my YouTube channel. <coughs> yard sale in a box, a great big box of records that he must have purchased at one yard sale and just sent them all up. And uh, included in the yard sale in a box was a bunch of k records including this one, The Music Machine, from 1970... Uh, God, 75, I think? 77. I listen to all those k records, and let me tell you, people, right now, I'm here to testify that this is the perfect 1977 FM hit radio time capsule. This, all, this album's got 20 songs on it, and every single one of them was a hit on Y100, when I was in the seventh going into eighth grade. There's not a single song on this record I didn't recognize. I don't I don't like all of them, but there's plenty on here I really like a lot. And every single one of them I recognized. And very evocative. So Music Machine on k -Tel Records has been getting much, much airplay on my home turntable. So I gotta thank you again, Adam, for sending this along with, with all those others great with those other great k -Tel records. And um, I actually have a, uh, from the competitor, Ronco, I was at a yard sale in Jackson, Michigan, and I found a factory-sealed carton of Ronco Record Vax, brand new in the box. So I'm going to take this k -Tel music machine, I'm going to put it through my Ronco Record Vac, and have the best listening experience that a 1977-era Gen Xer could possibly have. Ronco and k -Tel. Is that a tag team, or is that a tag team? Yeah! So I'm going to conclude by saying that I have talked about weird records, great vinyl, country and western, Bollywood, we checked the bulletin board, we checked the mailbox, but I promised, I promised that I was going to talk about not only records, but a knife. A knife. Now that's a sort of odd and unusual topic to talk about a knife, 
but it is germane and it is relevant to my career as a rock and roller. Now, <clears throat> as you know, unless you have not been paying attention, unless you got cloth ears or something, I have been the strummer of the thunder lumber for the almighty anti-scene for a little bit over four years now. And it is a rock and roll dream come true. We do a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff. It's an awesome thing to go from being a fan of the band to a friend of the band to a full-time member of the band. I can only hope that any of you out there who play music can find yourself in a similar position. It's a lot of work, of course, but it's uh, it's worth it. it. It pays off, you know? You get what you put into it. And I am very happy to be a hard worker for Anti-Scene Incorporated. So <clears throat> the most recent project that we engaged in was, uh, I guess, about a month ish ago, six weeks ago. I don't even, I don't remember. No, actually, I take the back. It was in February. Oh my God, February. So closer to three months ago, we had a super duper productive weekend. In one weekend, Anti-Scene tackled not one, but two mega projects. The first one was a live video recording session to herald the imminent re-release of the Here to Ruin Your Groove album. Uh, we got Trip McNeil, the guy who played bass on that album, and of course Sir Barry Hannibal, who was the drummer, Jeff Clayton, the vocalist, and our current guitar player, Walt Wheat, to play the album from start to finish. Got a professional video crew to videotape it, and that is going to be aired live on the Anti-Scene official Facebook page when the album is ready to go on sale. So that's going to be a bonus gala event. The day afterwards, the current lineup, the Ultra lineup, which basically swapped out Trip McNeil on bass for myself on bass, we recorded a special super duper semi-secret album called The People's Choice. And I actually, if you'll indulge me for one second, can reach over here to my stack of unfinished work. In this particular pile, whoa! This is welcome to my life, guys. I live in a tiny little house and I got too much stuff in it. Got cassettes I've been manufacturing. More cassettes I've been manufacturing. And the test pressing for the Anti-Scene People's Choice album, which is going to be sold at our, the upcoming 40th anniversary show. How's that for more incentive to go to Spartanburg, South Carolina on September 30th? I ask you! So we did it, we recorded it, it was great, it was fantastic, it was a lot of fun. <coughs> And then imagine my extremely pleasant surprise when at the end of the day, after doing the People's Choice, our guitar player, Walt Wheat, presented everybody who was in the band, and I think in certain key members of the crew, with, I guess, what you would call these days a participation medal. Please forgive the terminology. Maybe it was a completion bonus. Maybe it is a, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, but basically it was sort of his way of saying thank you for participating. And Walt is a man of many talents. He is a full-time professional landscaper. He is a leather worker. He is a gunsmith. He is a metalsmith. And for those of us who rocked our socks off in the service of the almighty anti-scene, he presented custom-made, hand-forged knives. Souvenir knives. Kind of like the ones that you used to be able to buy at Stuckey's when Stuckey's was a thing. You could go to Stuckey's and get yourself a souvenir butter knife. In this case, it's an anti-scene souvenir skinning knife. You know, for example, just in the... Um, Oh, as Miranda Pixley says, Miranda from Future Hate in Mobile, Alabama, fine band, a perfect attendance award. Yes, that's what it is. We were there both days and for rehearsals, so we got a reward. Um, for example, as I was riding my bike earlier today, 
I came across, ironically enough, a freshly killed possum in the middle of the road. And there was a vulture just waiting for its chance to feast on it. If I'd been packing my skinning knife, I could have gone to work on that possum carcass, made myself a possum skin hat. Or I could have waited for the vulture to drop dead of old age and then gone to work on it and made myself like a very nice feathered vest out of vulture feathers. It would have been very cool. And I would have used this knife to do it. But look at this, this handmade by Walt Wheat. He actually forged this thing with a hammer in extreme heat and pure skill and muscle power. Pretty good. And um, we are selling anti-scene commemorative knives made of a similar make and construct, but with a different handle. If you go to the anti-scene Facebook page or the anti-scene big cartel store, you can get the information on it. This is just the kind of merchandising that I'm a sucker for souvenirs. I'm a sucker for merchandising. This is the kind of thing I'm going to tell you right now. No one's ever done this. Nobody. Nobody. I don't have to name names. I already know that uh, Beyonce never made a commemorative knife. Britney Spears never did. Mariah Carey never did. Um, Boy George never did. George Michael never did. Will Smith never did. Nope. Anti-Scene are the only ones. And this is what we call a real trademark of quality. And that's just one more reason that I am happy and proud to be in this band because we do stuff that is genuinely unique. So there you go, guys. An entire show about records and one knife. Yay. And that does indeed wrap it up. I think I've talked myself into complete oblivion right now. I want to thank everybody for tuning in. It is always, always great fun to hang out with you guys and read your comments and talk back and forth with you. Allison, my good pal Allison, who's out in L.A., says, Harry merch. Harry, what do you think? Harry t-shirts? Harry butter knives? What should it be? What should it be? Let me know. I'll read all your comments. So anyway, yep. Thank you for tuning in. I do expect to be back in about 167 hours. And until such time, or as until we do meet again, this is Malcolm Tent saying so long from the Nutmeg State. <laughs>